On September 1st, 1859, a gigantic explosion on the sun sent radiation and matter flying towards Earth, resulting in one of the largest geomagnetic storms on record. The auroras that night were bright enough to read by and were visible as far south as Hawaii, but the real impact came from the disruption of the telegraph system. Across Europe and North America, telegraph systems failed, in some cases shocking their operators or throwing sparks from their machinery. What in the world, or should I say universe, caused this crazy storm? And should we be worried about it happening again? So we know the sun produces energy as light and heat, but we don't often think about all of the wild things happening on and below its surface. And some of those things can affect us all the way down here on Earth. Our sun is a yellow dwarf star, so large that the volume of 1.3 million Earths could fit inside of it. But if we travel deep inside our sun, the temperature is 15 million degrees Celsius, which is hot and dense enough to fuse hydrogen atoms into helium, a process called nuclear fusion that gives off massive amounts of energy. But today, we're more interested in what's happening on the relatively cooler surface of the sun called the photosphere. Let's back up a little bit, a little more, just a touch farther, that's better. The surface of the sun is 5,500 degrees Celsius and covered in gases that are constantly moving and changing. It's covered by a thin layer called the chromosphere. This layer is usually hard to see, but can be seen as bright red when viewed with specific light filters or during a solar eclipse. Right above that is the corona, the super hot outer atmosphere of plasma that looks like a crown or corona during a solar eclipse. The corona extends far above the surface of the sun eventually merging into the solar wind that moves throughout the solar system. These images from NASA's Solar Dynamics Observatory were taken with special telescopes that allow us to look at the solar atmosphere in many different wavelengths of light, each telling us something a little different about what's happening. And if you look at these many different images, you'll see that there are giant explosions, big spots, and huge loops of plasma all over the sun's surface. So what is up with the sun. It's doing some wild and seemingly mysterious things. Well, hot electrically charged plasma flows within the sun, constantly moving. The movement of these charged particles creates currents, and these electrical currents create magnetic fields. This phenomena of turning motion into magnetism is called a dynamo, and so the sun's magnetic field is a result of the solar dynamo. Compared to Earth's relatively tame magnetic field with just a north and south pole, these looping, twisting fields of magnetism on the sun are far more dynamic. In this image of the sun, you can see lots of looping lines that seem to come off of its surface. These are prominences, giant loops of plasma that stretch out from the sun's photosphere. The plasma is composed of electrically charged hydrogen and helium. These prominences follow the sun's magnetic field lines and extend out into the corona, the sun's extended atmosphere. Scientists are still trying to figure out exactly how and why they happen. Oh, and these prominences are huge. Just look at this image of Earth superimposed for scale. But prominences are just the start of weird things happening on the sun. See these dark spots? They're called sunspots, and what's happening inside of them is really crazy. These are areas where the magnetic field of the sun has become so great that it causes the atmospheric pressure in the area to decrease. What happens is the intense magnetic field prevents hot gas from the center of the sun from flowing outward towards the surface, creating a cool spot on the sun that appears darker than the surrounding areas. Sometimes, astronomers will observe rapid, intense changes in brightness on the surface of the sun, like this. These are solar flares. Solar flares are intense bursts of radiation from the sun that occur when huge amounts of stored magnetic energy are rapidly released. Solar flares create intense bursts of light that can last for minutes or for hours, and often occur near sunspots. Sometimes, when this magnetic energy is released, eruptions on the surface of the sun can also send billions of tons of solar matter flying out into space. This is called a coronal mass ejection, or CME. These send giant clouds of magnetized particles hurtling out into space. Flares and CMEs often happen together, with a bright flash followed by the giant arcing explosion but CMEs can also happen on their own. And these can be big explosions. CMEs can contain a billion tons of matter and can travel faster than 5 million miles per hour. 
they can accelerate protons and electrons ahead of them as they travel towards us, creating storms of these fast-moving, high-energy particles. And despite the sun being 93 million miles away, all of these solar weather events can still have effects right here on Earth, from stunningly beautiful auroras to radio blackouts. Light X-rays and gamma rays from a flare arrive at the Earth in just eight minutes. But CMEs can take hours to days to arrive, bombarding the Earth with charged particles and magnetic field from the corona. Thankfully, our atmosphere and magnetosphere protect our fragile human bodies from most of this. Fast-moving particles from the sun interact with the Earth's magnetic field and particles trapped in our local space environment. Eventually, the energy transfer results in charged particles colliding with oxygen and nitrogen in our uppermost atmosphere, causing auroras like the northern lights. And the emitted light is specific to each molecule. Oxygen atoms typically give off a greenish yellow or red light. Nitrogen atoms give auroras a blue hue, and nitrogen gas can appear a reddish pink. Usually, you can only see auroras towards Earth's poles. This is because Earth's own magnetic field lines direct the stream of incoming particles towards the poles. But sometimes, a solar event is so big, you can see it across the world. And that's what happened in 1859. Richard Carrington, an amateur astronomer, was peering through his telescope and sketching out sunspots when he noticed two bright white patches erupting from the spots. These two flares disappeared in about five minutes, but caused the biggest recorded geomagnetic storm. Early the next morning, just before dawn, stunningly bright auroras appeared across the world, visible as far south as Cuba, the Bahamas, and Hawaii. People in the northeastern U.S. reported being able to read the newspaper by the light of the auroras alone. And a Baltimore newspaper described the city being lit up as if under a luminous cloud. But as beautiful as they were, they also caused huge disruptions to the telegraph system. And yes, as you're watching this on YouTube, that might sound kind of quaint, but at the time, it was a major method of communication. In its simplest form, a telegraph is a transmitter and a receiver connected by an open circuit. We talk more about circuits in our episode about the world's biggest batteries. You can send a telegraph message by pressing down on a transmission key, which completes the circuit. This sends an electric pulse to the receiver, which causes an electromagnet in the receiver to attract a small iron arm, whose movement makes a mark on a paper. By tapping away in Morse code, you can send messages over long distances using electricity. So yeah, gigantic bursts of electromagnetic radiation from the sun can kind of mess with a system based on sending precise electric signals. When a CME reaches our planet, the gigantic blob of solar atmosphere and magnetic field rattles the Earth like a bell, generating electric currents both in our atmosphere and in long conductors like pipes and power lines. This is what created the massive electrical currents that overwhelmed the telegraph system, causing some to shoot out sparks and even lighting the telegraph paper on fire in places. Many lines stopped working, but some telegraph operators reported that the aurora-induced currents allowed them to transmit messages even after they had unplugged the batteries from their machines. But first-hand accounts aren't the only way to investigate past geomagnetic storms. Sometimes we can see the side effects of giant solar storms trapped in ice. CMEs act like giant bulldozers plowing through interplanetary space, pushing big waves of high-energy particles, including protons and electrons, ahead of them. When these particles collide with the atoms and molecules in our atmosphere, they create radioactive atoms. Some, like carbon-14, are incorporated into living organisms and let us do things like carbon dating. And if you want to watch more about the chemistry that enables carbon dating, check out our episode on Lake Nyos. But beyond just carbon-14, these storms of particles can create radioactive isotopes like beryllium-10 and chlorine-36, which can then fall down to Earth and become locked in ice. By drilling cores into the ice in undisturbed areas like Antarctica and Greenland, Scientists can find evidence of these particle storms associated with CMEs that happened long before we were able to track them with modern technology. In fact, ice cores have shown evidence of three major solar storms in 994 CE, 775 CE, and 660 BCE. All three were also corroborated by spikes in radioactive carbon found in tree rings. While early evidence showed that there may also be a trace of the 1859 event in an ice core, it's more likely that what the scientists saw was in fact due to large amounts of burning biomass 
like large forest fires in North America, which could mean that these other three events were much, much bigger than the 1859 event. So should we be worried about another event like this happening and wiping out all of our technology? We've progressed quite a bit since the telegraph, but that really just makes us more at risk if something of this scale were to happen today. Your phone, the internet, GPS, radios, credit cards, the transformers that help supply power to your home, all of these could be affected by a big enough geomagnetic storm. And the biggest fear is that these solar storms could affect the power grid, which would affect anything that relies on electricity. So basically everything. And we've had a relatively recent taste of what this could do to our modern systems. In the 70s, a CME knocked out long distance telephone lines in Illinois. Another one in 1989 disrupted a power plant in Quebec, causing a large blackout. And in 2005, a solar storm disrupted the satellite to ground GPS navigation system for 10 minutes. And while that doesn't sound like very long, that's a pretty big problem since everything from boats to planes to farming equipment to the entire financial industry relies on GPS every single day. Some estimates have found that a CME the size of the one that happened in 1859 could cause trillions of dollars of damage if it were to hit our technological infrastructure today. But these events are really rare, and with early warning, we can prepare for an incoming solar storm. Power companies, airlines, shipping companies, and others are all aware of the risks and work with space agencies to keep tabs on what might be coming. NASA's Solar Shield project started in 2010 uses spacecraft data to identify and model CMEs, creating 3D images of them that can help to predict where and when they might strike. This can give power companies time to turn their power grids off, saving them from damage. Easily deployable temporary transformers could also be set up in case of emergency to quickly replace damaged parts of the grid. And more innovative solutions have also been proposed, like launching giant loops of conductive wire to space to partially deflect incoming particles and magnetic fields. So if a big solar storm does head our way, don't worry. We are much more prepared today than we were back in 1859.